Hey, Campfire Crew, let's get it on. Home Alone Break-In by Are We Human Enough? This happened six years ago when I was 20. I came home after sleeping at my boyfriend's place. It was like 8 in the morning. Early because my boyfriend had started his shift and my parents were already gone like an hour earlier to their holidays. So I was alone at home. And I knew it. I got home and I directly went to my bedroom to continue my night. But before climbing the stairs, I saw the kitchen door window were wide open. I was surprised, but I didn't think that I was in any danger inside of my own house. I have to say that my father is a super paranoid guy, and there's no way he would have forgotten to close the windows before leaving the house for two weeks, even if I stayed because I used to sleep at my boyfriend's house most of the time. But I was barely awake, so I just closed the door. I checked the kitchen and the living room just to be sure, and then went up to my room. I lived on the second floor, and there were three rooms up there. As I was changing, I went to the bathroom and got back to my room and closed the door to my room, and I don't know why, because he normally never did. After scrolling on my phone for another five minutes, I heard a footstep right behind my door. Someone had been out there while I was doing my thing, completely vulnerable. I was terrified. My heart stopped and I couldn't move. I just took the first thing in front of me to defend myself. My babyless. I stared at my door, waiting for the person to open up and kill me or worse. I was ready to jump out of the window and die if I had seen that door open. But minutes passed and I finally heard the person on the stairs. I don't know how many minutes I stayed there, immobile. But eventually, I called my boyfriend and he came to get me. At first I thought I was crazy because I didn't see anything, and I couldn't believe that it really happened. But my boyfriend confirmed that whoever it was forced the door and windows on the kitchen, so someone really was there. They really were silently waiting for me to sleep, to get out of the house. What was creepy for me was that I felt safe while I was home, but I clearly was not. It was a little traumatic. Since then, I have a hard time staying alone anywhere without freaking out a little bit. I live on my own, and I'm constantly afraid that someone is trying to break in. But the worst part of that day? When they broke into my parents' house, they didn't take anything. They didn't take my mom's MacBook or jewelry, my PS4, my dad's gaming setup. I mean, everything there was so easy to take, but they didn't take a thing. I can't stop thinking that they were there for another reason. At that time, I was also very active on Snapchat, and I used to post every day. I used to tell and put my story on every part of the day. So to the 5,000 of unknown followers that I had on social media, they knew so much more about me at that time. And I think that was maybe related to whoever was in the house. Since then, I've stopped my activities on Snapchat. So what do you guys think? Is that related? Or did I just interrupt a run-of-the-mill break-in? Hobbling Hitchhiker by Got Me Fooled One evening, I was out in Lacey, Washington to pick up a handgun I had recently purchased for protection. Contrary to the pickup status both online and sent to my email, the store didn't have it in stock yet and told me to come back in another week. I lived about an hour from Lacey at the time, and when I had gotten there, evening rush hour was just beginning to become unbearable. I didn't want to drive all the way back home just yet, as it would add an additional hour to my already long commute. Side note, the car I was driving belonged to my dad, and I was borrowing it until I had had enough money saved up for a new car after my beloved Honda had broken down the previous year. 
I killed some time bumming around the store that I had purchased my firearm from, and then decided to drive over to the nearest coffee shop. It was a newly built cabin-style cafe with a modern twist. The barista handed me my 16-ounce dirty chai, and I walked back out to my car. Then I drove to a gas station around the corner, still trying to kill time until traffic thinned out. The car didn't need gas, so I pulled into a parking spot right at the corner of the block the gas station was on. I turned off the engine, stepped outside, and lit up a smoke, leaning against the driver's side door so as not to stink up the interior. The weather was overcast and drizzly, but not overly cold. It was dusk, and most daylight had disappeared. The stoplights in the intersection were diffused by the late autumn mist, and I just stood there watching them flicker from green to yellow to red, and again as the traffic was orchestrated accordingly. Zoned out by the lights and being generally lost in thought while enjoying my coffee and smoke, I didn't notice the man walking toward me until he was already halfway across the street. He was white, average height, and strawberry blonde, maybe in his mid-twenties. He definitely hadn't changed his clothes in a good while and carried a backpack, I assumed, to be full of the few belongings that he had. He didn't smell, but he looked raggedy and unkempt, and my immediate thought was that drugs were likely part of his lifestyle. I didn't want to jump to conclusions, but I'm always cautious having grown up in the suburbs of Seattle. The man finished crossing the street, awkwardly limped toward my car, and maintained eye contact with me and winced a grin. I locked my car out of caution, but remained outside smoking casually. Normally I'm not a social person, but I don't go out of my way to be unpleasant either. He approached me and stood about ten feet away when he said, Hello, and asked if I had a light. I complied hesitantly, but saw no harm in meeting his simple request. Taking two steps forward, I lit his cigarette which he was holding out towards me while approaching. He attempted to make small talk, weaving in hints that he had just gotten off the bus and still needed to get down the road another block. Somewhere in his poorly crafted sob story, he stopped himself mid-sentence like a bad actor and pretended to be struck by an epiphany. Hey, would you mind just dropping me off down the road? It's not very far. I apologized and said I couldn't help because it was my dad's car, not my own, and I didn't feel comfortable without my dad's permission. It was a stupid yet plausible excuse I came up with on the spot. This guy didn't like my answer, and his smile immediately turned tense and flatlined. Clearly upset, he became more insistent. But it's just down the road, he said. My leg is killing me, and it wouldn't even be far for you. I'll give you a cigarette. His persistence and sudden burst of hostility made my hair stand up. I firmly said, nope. I'm sorry, I can't help you. It's my dad's car, and he has set rules. This was absolute BS. With ten years of hospitality under my belt, I immediately offered him alternate logical ideas of what he could do to get where he needed to be. I even mentioned maybe someone in the gas station we were outside of could help him out or call him a ride. Every word I said made him increasingly irate, and he began curling his fingers into fists. Not in a threatening way, but like a toddler about to scream bloody murder for not getting his way. He seemed to pause and size me up in a fleeting moment. I'm small, and I'm not at all intimidating physically. So I just told him I hope he made it home safe, quickly unlocked my car, jumped in, and locked myself inside. While I was looking up from locking the car door, I saw him speed walking back across the street from the direction he originally came from. No limp. No awkward walk whatsoever. No distress or pain showing even slightly. Just a normal speed walk of a physically well person. I knew I had dodged a bullet, and I felt pretty dumb for hanging around the city after dark alone. At that point, I didn't care about traffic anymore, so I turned over my engine and hightailed it home in what ended up being another hour and 45-minute drive. But this time, the traffic was 100% worth the inconvenience. So this is a PSA if you haven't heard enough already. Be careful who you give your attention to, especially when you're alone.
Always stay aware and err on the side of caution, even when strangers seem harmless at first. Crazy bad acting hitchhiker guy? I hope you got the help you needed, rather than the help you wanted. And I hope we never meet again. The Four Men by Clear Dirt When I was about 25, I was living with my boyfriend at the time in a one-bedroom apartment in San Diego. Our apartment building was on a main road next to other apartments and shopping centers. It was pretty busy during the daytime, but at nighttime it was definitely quieter. We had just gotten a puppy together, a little gray spotted pit bull who was only around three months at the time. So he was really little, and therefore wouldn't be able to protect me in public from any weirdos. Before I dive deep into the story, I think it's important to highlight that at this time in my life, I was really into listening to true crime podcasts and had recently purchased the book The Gift of Fear, written by Gavin De Becker. I was only a few chapters into this book at the time, but basically, it highlighted the fact that our bodies will send us a flight-or-fight response signal way before we are even aware of dangerous or sketchy situations about to happen. Even if it's just a gut feeling that's a little off, a feeling like someone is watching you, or getting goosebumps just by looking at a stranger we don't know. Along with my knowledge of true crime, the basic points I learned in this recently purchased book, and my dad's strict nature and repetitive lectures about stranger danger situations, I felt like I had a good sense of identifying sketchy situations and not writing them off in the moment just so I can be polite in public. On the day of this incident, I was getting home pretty late from my friend's house, who lived about ten minutes away. I had just brought the puppy over to her house for a little while to play and hang out, and I didn't end up getting back home with the puppy until about 10.30, so pretty late for a weekday. There was only street parking where we lived, so I parked my car right off the busy road I had mentioned earlier and gathered my stuff inside the car before I opened my car door. During the time that I lived at this apartment, there would sometimes be random homeless people or people on drugs who would wander down to the street during the day. For that reason, I always checked outside my car windows and rearview mirrors before I got out of my car, especially at night, just to be sure there weren't any weirdos or sketchy people outside waiting for me. The coast was clear when I checked my outside mirrors, so I proceeded to get out of my car, grab my things, and get my puppy out of the passenger side. Just as I was almost finished gathering my belongings and my pup, a lowrider type of car pulled up just ahead of me. It parked right outside another small apartment complex that I had to walk past to get to my building. It didn't seem odd at first, because my initial thought was they were either dropping someone off or picking someone up from that exact apartment. Still, I was wary of the car, because it was so late, and I'm usually paranoid for my own safety. For about a minute, the car was just sitting there. To me, it felt like too long of a time, to be honest, and I was confused why no one was, one, exiting the vehicle, or two coming out of the apartment complex to get into the car. I went ahead and shut my passenger side door, locked the car, and slowly started to walk back to my apartment building. I had only taken about seven slow steps before I got this weird pit feeling in my stomach, like I should turn back and not pass by the car that was just sitting there. At that moment, I noticed that there were four guys all sitting in the car, with one sitting in the passenger seat, just staring back at me out the right side view mirror. They were around my age, late 20s or early 30s. But to be honest, they looked a bit sketchy. Not like random guys my age you would see populating San Diego. These guys didn't look like they were from the area. I don't know how to explain it, but my brain was just taking in as much info as it could because I was sketched out. Immediately, I also felt that bit of guilt thinking that way, just profiling strangers as being sketchy when they hadn't exactly done anything yet. After all, I'm probably just being paranoid. Plus, my apartment was close already. What was the worst that could happen? I could probably try and run if they jumped out of the car. 
but considering I had a three-month-old puppy with me and about three bags I was carrying, I would be slowed down and I didn't want to risk the chance. I decided to turn around and walk back to my car, acting like I forgot something that I needed to get. I opened my passenger side door again and just pretended to shuffle around inside, while I kept an eye on the car out of my peripheral vision. They were still just sitting there with the car idling, when that guy was still staring at me out of the rearview mirror. I immediately called my boyfriend as he was inside the apartment, and I figured it would be best if he came out and walked me inside. So I called him. No answer. So I called again, and no answer. Finally, he called me back. God bless. I answered and proceeded to tell him about the sketchy car, and asked him to come outside as fast as he could. I was far enough away from the men that they couldn't hear my conversation, and I figured it helped to be at least on the phone with someone in case they did try to do anything. It felt like ten minutes before my boyfriend came out. It was probably only two. But when he did, he managed to walk at a normal pace towards me from afar, not quick enough to my liking. The men in the car didn't immediately put two and two together that I knew this guy, until he finally made his way to me and helped me grab two of the bags that were in my hand. That was the second they realized that this guy was my boyfriend, and they sped off as fast as they could down the road. But... That's not it. Up ahead, down the road, they made a U-turn back towards us, and when I saw that, my heart began to race. They drove up really slow on the other side of the street just to mug me and my boyfriend. All four of them did it. Such a weird-ass stare-down situation. But then once again, they sped off. I immediately called the police to report the vehicle in the direction I saw them headed. But San Diego is a pretty big city, and I didn't get the license plate number of the car. There wasn't much else I could do, and I never found out if they were pursued or not. Needless to say, I've since analyzed this incident and kind of believe that they were either trying to steal my puppy or steal me. I know a lot of people try to steal pit bull puppies for illegal dogfighting in the area, so that could have been it. Or it could have been more sinister. They could have been trying to kidnap me for whatever reason, including something like sex trafficking, as that is super common in the Southern California area. There have been a lot of recent PSAs about sex trafficking becoming more popular around this time, and regardless, I wouldn't have been able to take on four grown men, even if I did have a can of pepper spray on me. Whatever the reason, I'm happy I escaped a potentially dangerous situation. And I'm also very thankful that I happen to just have started reading that book telling me to trust my gut. Otherwise, I'm not sure if I would have trusted my gut reaction telling me to turn back to my car. Always trust your gut, people. And don't ever feel bad for being rude to protect your safety, and don't write yourself off as being paranoid. It's better to be safe than sorry. Also, get a dog to protect you if you can, laughing my ass off. I don't have my dog anymore because I'm no longer with my boyfriend from that time. But when my puppy grew up, I felt way more safe walking around the neighborhood. He was such a love bug when he met people, unless the person was clearly a weirdo. But if I was walking around at night, he had his guard up and he would definitely protect me if prompted to. So, to the four men in the car I came across that day, let's never meet again. Biggest Plot Twist of My Life by Potential Wallaby I haven't told a ton of people this story, and thinking about it still haunts me sometimes. A couple of years ago, my best friend was staying in an apartment duplex in Michigan with her son. She lived alone with him, who I think was one or two at the time. The building she moved into was super old, and I had even made a joke like, oh, this place is definitely haunted. After a few months, she got all settled in and things were going great. 
She was close with her neighbors and had made a ton of friends down there. But after a while, she started noticing weird things. She heard weird footsteps and whispers and things would get moved around. We both ignored it, but since it was an older house, stuff like that would happen. We chalked things up to the house just settling and being noisy sometimes. Until there was one instance where we both heard stuff moving around in her son's room. We went in. He was sleeping in his crib. At that point, we decided this place was haunted. We both always loved ghost stories, so in reality, we were pretty excited about it. I'd go over there, and we'd hang out in her basement while her son was asleep. We'd hear footsteps, and we'd get super spooked. But it was almost fun. We'd put things in place like we knew the ghost would move. Around this time, TikTok was really blowing up, as well as the horror side of TikTok. So I made the suggestion for her to put up cameras in the house and see if we could catch anything on video. And what could go wrong? We were going to get everything on video and we were excited about the idea of it going viral. It was kind of like a dream. The first night, when she got the motion detected, she turned on her camera and we saw what it was. It wasn't a ghost. It was her neighbor watching her son sleep. I know it's a given, but the cops were called immediately and it was sorted out. What got me is that we would hear these things moving around when we were both home. And we were both just thinking it was a ghost. Nope. It was confirmed. It was her neighbor breaking into her house every single time. Stealing money and other things. But he would also just walk around and hang out there when her and her son were at home. We talked about the possibility of him even breaking in when she was asleep and just watching her. The thought of that still freaks me out. Needless to say, she moved out shortly after that and moved far away from that place, where she and her family are safe. Hey gang, thanks for listening to this episode of Uncle Josh's True Scary Stories. If you have a true scary story of any nature that you'd like to hear narrated on my channel or podcast, email it to UncleJoshTrueScaryStories at gmail.com. I read them all. If you haven't already, please like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Leave a comment below and let me know what you thought of the stories, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Follow me on social media. Links to that are in the description, as well as a link to my Patreon page and my storefront at tpublic.com. That's for those of you who would like to take your support of this channel a little bit further. I am actually on my vacation this week up in the beautiful Adirondacks, so I hope everybody is okay with the format that I've got going this week. The shorter episodes are a little easier for me to be doing while I need some well-deserved R&R. Everyone. Be excellent to each other, and until next time, be wary of things that go bump in the night. It could be anything. A ghost, a monster, or the guy next door.